بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا يا كريم Dear colleagues as we continue the series of pediatric imaging we will discuss now one of the important subjects which uh, deals with imaging of the pediatric intracranial infections. Then we have uh, discussed this uh, subject uh, before uh, whenever we talked about imaging of intracranial infection in the uh, series of uh, uh, brain imaging. In the, the uh, the lesions are almost the same in the pediatric patient and in the adult cases and we will discuss these uh, uh, issues from this point of view you remember we we have uh, discussed the, the adult cases uh, into these categories the congenital uh, lesions and uh, the issue of encephalitis, then cerebritis, glenomatous disease, fungal and parasitic infection. And finally, we talked about some of the HIV manifestations in the adult brain. Actually, I will uh, discuss the same issues except for the last one. And uh, uh, we'll start by uh, some of the basic informations about intracranial infection and uh, the first issue is we always need to inject contrast media uh, intravenously whenever we are evaluating a case of suspected intracranial inflammation or infection and uh, this applies for the CT and also for MRI Contrast injection is very important even if the lesion did not enhance after injection of contrast. This will help in the differential diagnosis. And we have two uh, uh, very common appearances after injection of contrast uh, material. The first uh, appearance is the uh, that we see here in an MRI image after contrast injection where is, you can appreciate that the meninges covering the surface of the brain are thickened and enhanced, and this will help to diagnose meningitis. Then if you see an interaxial lesion with a uniform uh, marginal enhancement, similar to this one, and you may think of an abscess. Then we'll start by the congenital or neonatal inter intracranial infection, which are usually referred to by the uh, abbreviations, uh, uh, the TORSH. TORSH means, uh, is the, stands for uh, Toxoplasma, Rubella, Cytomegalovirus, and uh, Herpes simplex virus. All these uh, infections may occur intrauterine uh, or during uh, birth and uh, the appearances are almost similar on uh, CT and MRI and they uh, uh, will be commonly present by uh, the presence of very ventricular uh, foci of calcification distributed everywhere in the uh, cerebral hemispheres. Then these are the uh, ways of transmission of the uh, congenital intracranial infection. Number one by, is the by bloodstream or the hematogenous route, and uh, this will uh, be the route for uh, toxoplasma and most of the viruses except the herpes simplex type 2. Uh, this virus is transmitted in the birth canal and uh, most of the bacteria leading to cerebritis will uh, uh, be an ascending infection during, uh, during delivery. Then uh, the presence of calcium 
uh, in the periventricular area is usually suggestive of an intracranial infection. And this calcium or the distribution of calcium may suggest the type of infection. However, this is not conclusive. And it is always written in the literature that whenever you see a periventricular calcium, and this calcium is uh, uh, intimately related to the wall of the ventricle, like this, what we call subepidymal calcification, you may uh, feel that this uh, infection is due to cytomegalovirus. While uh, if the calcium is haphazardly distributed, with a special or a slight predilection for the basal ganglia, then you may think of toxoplasmosis. And if you see a brain scan like this with multiple foci of calcification scattered in the periventricular area of both cerebral hemispheres, then you may say that this, one of the differential diagnoses is the congenital intracranial infection, but you are not able to know which of which is the cause of infection. And toxoplasma is a protozoan which is uh, transmitted by cat to the cattle, then to the human being. If it is transmitted by food, it will result in acquired infection which will affect mainly the chest. But if it is uh, transmitted through the placenta, then it will result in the congenital infection which will affect mainly the brain. Then toxoplasma is a protozoan and then this infection may occur during the first or the second or the third uh, trimester and uh, if it is late in the pregnancy it will uh, result in subclinical infection. And 10% of uh, the patients will have a bad splenomegaly, jaundice, and uh, CNS manifestations. Of course, in the CT scan, you will see calcium, which is distributed uh, around the, the ventricles, and also you may see hydrocephalus, which is commonly due to aqueductal stenosis. And this is the CT scan of a case of a toxoplasma infection where you can see extensive periventricular calcification and also calcium in the basal ganglia and calcium around the ventricles. You can also appreciate that the skull is relatively small and that there is a dandy walker malformation in the posterior fossa in the form of a big retrocerebellar CSF containing cyst which is communicating with the fourth ventricle through the ablastic worms as I have mentioned before in the lecture of hydrocephalus. And this protozoan is treated by antibiotics. And cytomegalovirus is one of the herpes viruses. It uh, infects every person at uh, some time of his life. And the infection of the infected pregnant woman may transmit this to the fetus. The infection occurs by bloodstream through the placenta it will result in the same manifestations in the form of multiple periventricular calcification. But uh, this calcium, in most of the cases, is intimately related to the wall of the ventricle occurring in the subependymal area. And this is a case of cytomegalovirus infection with <coughs> CT scan showing uh, uh, evident very ventricular subependymal uh, sub calcium. Um, it's worth to know that uh, calcium of uh, congenital intracranial infection is not usually seen by MRI. And this is an example. <coughs> this is a female child, two years old, with uh, cytomegalovirus infection. There are multiple subependymal veriventricular calcium, which is well seen by the CT scan, while the images of MRI uh, did not show the same uh, manifestation. Uh, there are subtle uh, low signal lesions in the wall of the ventricle, which may be suggestive of the presence of calcium. Then uh, this is a case of cytomegalovirus infection 
in a patient with uh, uh, a periventricular calcium. This calcium is located also in the genome of the corpus callosum. And here you can see calcium, which is away from the wall of the ventricle. I said that this is not a role, the presence or the site of the uh, calcium relative to the ventricular wall. Then uh, to emphasize that small calcium is not usually seen by MRI, and this is another example. You see multiple foci of calcification in the wall of the left lateral ventricle, and this calcium is not totally is not seen at all in the T2 and the flare weighted images MRI. Then encephalitis means that there is brain infection by viruses. And the infection by viruses is usually related to the immune uh, status of the patient. In patients who are immune suppressed or immune compromised are more liable for virus infection, whether they are children or adults. And you know, these are the major causes of immune suppression, the AIDS, then the cancer, and the organ transplant which is usually uh, followed by uh, the administration of a long course of immunosuppressive drugs. Then um, these are the manifestation of uh, viruses in the brain. There may be, they may affect the meninges resulting in meningitis, affecting the brain parenchyma resulting in encephalitis, or affecting both resulting in meningoencephalitis, and uh, this is one of the form of viral infections of the brain is known as acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis or ADEM. And there are other forms of subacute and the chronic encephalitis. Then the symptoms of encephalitis include usually fever and headache. And some of these uh, uh, manifestations such as lack of energy, energy dizziness, nausea and vomiting and some changes in the personality and so on. Then encephalitis by CT will show non-specific findings. There are multiple hypodense areas and MRI they will show low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2 and if you inject the contrast media in both CT and MRI it is usual that you don't see any enhancement but sometimes there is chiral enhancement after contrast injection. This is an example, female child, eight years old, with a massive hypodensity in the left cerebral hemisphere and a smaller one in the right cerebral hemisphere, denoting the presence of uh, uh, cerebral parenchymal lesions in the uh, good clinical settings, you are able to diagnose encephalitis. And this is also a case with non-contrast CT, post-contrast CT, and MRI flare weighted image showing bilateral, non-symmetrical cortical and subcortical lesions with uh, some post-contrast enhancement. And this is uh, uh, may be seen in some cases of encephalitis. Uh, the HIV virus may also affect the brain, resulting in encephalitis and um, in this case by MRI this is T1 and this T2 weighted images and you can see multiple bilateral cerebral lesions of low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2 and one of the well-known viruses affecting the brain parenchyma are is the herpes simplex and we have two types type 1 which is very common and this is non-sexually transmitted. It is transmitted by the bloodstream and it affects the children and adults. And uh, the more severe one, which is sexually transmitted, it is rare and is transmitted through the birth canal, will result in neonatal encephalitis. And uh, this will result in about 80% death of the uh, neonate and uh, if the unit is survived, 20% uh, will suffer severe damage. Then uh, herpes encephalitis is, uh, uh, has a certain 
uh, imaging findings, which are uh, the presence of lesions that uh, specifically located to the uh, medial part of the temporal lobe. And um, they, it is always said that uh, biopsy of the brain tissue is not usually needed since uh, the imaging findings are diagnostic. These imaging findings are in the form of uh, lesions in the temporal lobe, especially the medial part. They may be symmetric or asymmetric. They are hypodense in the CT, low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2 weighted image. And this is an example of unilateral pathology in the medial part of the temporal lobe on the right side. And this is an example of bilateral, almost symmetrical appearance of the uh, uh, lesions which show high signal in the flare image representing herpes encephalitis. And sometimes you can detect hemorrhage inside the uh, herpes uh, lesions. And this is an example. You see by CT scan, a hypodensity in the left temporal lobe with a small hyperdensity representing a focus of bleeding. And in the MRI T1 weighted image, you see the low signal of the lesion and the high signal of the blood. And the lesion became high signal in the T2 and also in the flare images. Then you are able in the flare to see a small focus on the right side near the insula. This is a CT scan pre and post contrast of a patient with herpes encephalitis showing a lesion uh, on the right side. And this lesion did not show uh, contrast enhancement after injection of contrast. In the MRI, T2 and diffusion weighted images showed that there are bilateral pathology. The left-sided lesion was not evident in the CT scan, but it is seen well in the MRI. And this is also another case of herpes encephalitis on the, on the left side. In the T1 weighted image, the lesion is not that evident, but you feel that there is some swelling of the temporal lobe with the relative effacement of the cortical sulci and sylvian fissure compared to the opposite side. But after contrast injection, you cannot see evident contrast enhancement. But in the MRI T2 weighted image, you can appreciate the lesion. And also in the flare image, you can see the lesion. And of course, in the diffusion weighted images, you'll see diffusion restriction. Then uh, after a, 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 a long time or a, a period of uh, infection with uh, management, then you will see that the brain will uh, suffer too many uh, uh, lesions indicating severe brain damage. And this is our no, known as the late uh, sequelae of encephalitis or what we call post-encephalitic manifestations. In patients with previous uh, viral encephalitis of the brain, uh, the, the follow-up studies may end by these appearances where you got extensive hypodensities within the brain parenchyma denoting areas of encephalomalacia extra axial usually subdural, subdural collections, uh, parenchymal and uh, dural calcifications, and dilatation of the ventricular system denoting the presence of atrophic changes. And this is what we call postencephalitic sequelae, where there is almost total damage of the brain parenchyma on both sides. <coughs> Only the basal ganglia are, appear intact, the ventricles are dilated and uh, uh, indicating the presence of atrophic changes. Acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis or ADAM is one of the uh, viral infections of the brain and it usually results in patches within the white matter which are almost similar to the uh, MS. Uh, lesions in the brain parenchyma. Then, uh, in order to uh, reach the diagnosis, there should be history of viral infection 
or flu like attack or history of vaccination two weeks before the uh, manifestations of this viral infection and this will help you to suspect that this infection is due to uh, Adam or acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis. In this disease, you will see multiple batches of low signal in, uh, M in the T1, high signal in the T2 and the flare. These are flare images. And uh, you see uh, lesions in the cortex as well as lesions in the white matter. Then, <clears throat> Patients will uh, will uh, complain of headache, drowsiness, and fever. Of course, this is very important. And later on, they will develop some neurological deficits like uh, upper limb weakness, lower limb weakness, scissors, and uh, the condition may end by death. And this is a case of acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis with a follow up after one year showing some regressive course of the disease and this disease is a monophasic disease so that you can able to differentiate this lesions from the lesions of ms acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis is diagnosed by the clinical picture of recent vaccination or a flu-like attack preceding the CNS manifestations by 10 days to 15 days. And these manifestations will occur in the brain and maybe also affect the spinal cord in the form of multiple batches of low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2 and flare-weighted weighted, flare -weighted images. And this is also a case of uh, acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis with multiple periventricular foci which are almost similar to the lesions of multiple sclerosis <clears throat> but the typical clinical history the presence of fever the monophasic uh, course of the disease are helpful in the differential diagnosis and this is also uh, a case of acute demyelinating encephalomyelitis which cannot be discriminated from MS on the basis of imaging. Since you see low signal in the T1, high signal in the T2 surrounded by edema, high signal in the flare, and after injection of contrast, and you can see this typical pattern of enhancing uh, MS blakes, which is an incomplete ring or incomplete marginal enhancement. Then there should be a positive uh, clinical history to help you to discriminate Adam from uh, the MS. And this is uh, the history, progressive left hemiparesis after having had a viral infection a week earlier. And this is the clue. Also, the presence of fever is one of the pathognomonic features of Adam, where, with, which is not present in cases of MS. And meningitis means that there is an inflammation of the meninges and uh, this inflammation may result from viral or bacterial or granulomatous infection. Of course, one of the common manifestations of meningitis is to result in hydrocephalus due to affection of the arachnoid villi which absorb the CSF from the subarachnoid space. And also, uh, being intimately related to the dural venous sinuses, it may result in sinus thrombosis, and this sinus thrombosis may also contribute to hydrocephalus, since it is the way for drainage of the CSF. And uh, the patient may develop subdural or epidural emboema, or the, extent, the infection may extend into the brain parenchyma, resulting in uh, infection, which may be in the form of Encephalitis, if it is due to viral, uh, if, uh, if the, the causative organism is a virus, or cerebritis, if the causative organism is bacteria. Then you see uh, the extension of the infection may reach the wall of the ventricle, resulting in ventriculitis and ebendymitis. And this is 
a CT scan pre-contrast and after contrast injection showing extensive meningeal enhancement <clears throat> so, okay, sorry for this interruption, uh, and I will uh, continue. And this is, as I have mentioned, this is a brain scan before contrast and after uh, injection of contrast. Then uh, you see. Uh, enhancement in the sylvian fissure, enhancement in the quadrigeminal cistern, and this means that the patient had a, an encephal and a meningitis. And this is also a case of meningitis showing enhancement of the quadrigeminal cistern as well as in the region of the basal ganglia. And this is an MRI T1 uh, uh, weighted image before contrast and after contrast injection. And you see leptomeningeal enhancement along the cerebellar folia, this fine linear enhancement, also along the tentorial leaflets and uh, uh, within the circumesencephalic cistern around the brain stem in the supracellular area, as well as in the sylvian cisterns and also along the surface of the brain. This is diagnostic of meningitis. And you can see that the temporal horns of the lateral ventricles are relatively distended, representing, uh, uh, denoting the presence of hydrocephalic changes. And this is a case of uh, meningoencephalitis, affection of the meninges as well as the related uh, cerebral tissue. In the T1 post contrast, and you can see this chiral pattern of enhancement, and then. Uh, in this diffusion weighted image, you can see the restricted diffusion in the involved parts of the brain parenchyma. Then, uh, as I have mentioned, that sinus thrombosis will uh, result in some cases in uh, dural uh, meningitis, will result in some cases in dural uh, sinus thrombosis, and this is a thrombosis of the internal cerebral uh, veins as well as the vein of gallon. If you see this study which is performed uh, without intravenous contrast injection and you can uh, appreciate the hyperdensity of the vein of gallon, also the hyperdensity of the internal cerebral veins and um, there is some hyperdensity in the region of the superior sagittal sinus in a patient with meningitis and obstructive hydrocephalus, then these are due to acute thrombus. And uh, in the course of meningitis, accumulation of bus may occur in the epidural space like this one or in the subdural space like this one. And this is a good example of subdural embyema. The uh, collection has a sick enhancing margin similar to the abscess. And you should remember that there is no epidural space in the midline and all lesions related to the falx and the tentorium are located in the subdural space. And this is a good example of a subdural emboema in the posterior falx cerebri showing low signal in the T1 high signal in the flare and T2-weighted images with uniform thick marginal enhancement 
and uh, this area of high signal is the reactive brain edema around the lesion and this is the diffusion weighted image showing evident restricted diffusion and this is an epidural uh, abscess or emboema they see the collection which is bordered by thick enhanced meninges whenever infection is has reached the ventricle it will result in inflammation of the ventricle with uh, 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 intense and uniform enhancement of the ventricular wall and this is known as ependymitis or ventriculitis then uh, this is a case of meningitis due to mastoiditis and then the post contrast image showed the extensive leptomeningeal enhancement over the surface of the brain and after healing of the acute attack the patient may develop a strial subdural collection which is known as subdural hygroma then cerebritis is usually uh, uh, referring to the inflammation of the brain tissue secondary to bacterial infection and um, this bacterial infection may reach the brain parenchyma from by the bloodstream or from a direct extension from a nearby focus like the sinuses or the ear on, or in some cases penetrating trauma or congenital heart disease with left to right shunt will lead to uh, uh, extension of uh, inflammatory uh, emboli to the uh, brain parenchyma. Then uh, in the early, early uh, inflammation of the brain parenchyma, you got non-specific findings. And uh, you, you see only an area of low signal in the T1 and high signal in the flare-weighted images, and it will show a restricted uh, diffusion and then there is significant surrounding edema. If you give a contrast injection like here, and he, you may not see uh, appreciable uh, enhancement. And you remember that uh, this lesion may simulate the glioma, for example, but uh, the gliomas usually show free diffusion, and the, this lesion is uh, showed restricted uh, diffusion. And this is one of the helpful uh, tools to discriminate between uh, neoplasms and uh, inflammatory lesions is the use of diffusion weighted images. After some time, then the, the area of cerebritis will liquefy to form an abscess. And the, the diagnosis of abscess is easy, where you can see a, a hypodense lesion with a, uniform thick enhancing margin surrounded by significant perifocal brain edema. Uh, the lesion will appear on MRI as low signal in the T1 and high signal in the T2 with a characteristic low signal margin surrounded by perifocal edema. After injection of contrast media, then you see thick enhancing margin and uh, is characteristically this margin is of uniform thickness all around the lesion and in the diffusion weighted images you will appreciate the diffusion restriction and uh, brain abscesses may uh, be small or may be large may have a thick margin or thin margin may uh, result in uh, the formation of daughter abscesses and uh, sometimes they appear multilocular like this abscess in the left timber lobe and the, you can see that the contents of the abscess uh, are of relative hyperdensity due to the presence of bus. And the uh, cerebellar abscesses are usually the sequelae of ear infection. And it is a good policy in the exams in particular. If you see a cerebellar abscess, and it's, it's, it's better to look to the uh, ipsilateral uh, mastoid and the middle ear searching for uh, an inflammatory lesion like this one which is uh, evident here then in the uh, early stages of abscess formation it has a thin enhancing margin while later on the enhancing margin will be uh, thick but in all cases the margin 
will be of uniform uh, thickness. And this is a good example of brain abscess in the right frontal lobe showing a high signal in the T2 with a low signal margin surrounded by high signal perifocal brain edema. Then the lesion showed a thick enhanced margin. And in the diffusion weighted images, there is evident diffusion restriction. Uh, the complications of brain abscesses is the development of satellite or daughter abscesses like this one. And you see an abscess here with two small abscesses nearby. Or also the abscess may extend to the ventricle resulting in ventriculitis or ependymitis or may extend to the leptomeninges resulting in meningitis. And this is an example of an abscess in the left uh, temporo-occipital, in the right temporo-occipital area that has extended to the ventricle, resulting in inflammation of the ventricular wall, and this is evident bilaterally with enhancement of the affected uh, ventricles. And this is also a case of ventriculitis with enhancement of the ventricular wall, and the ventricles are dilated, they are almost transformed into abscesses. And this is also a case of ebendimitis, where you can see thick enhancing ventricular wall uh, on both sides. The ventricles are transformed into abscesses. Then we came to the granulomatous infection, and uh, this will, in the pediatric age group, uh, the, on top of these craniometrous infections is the TB, and TB may result in meningitis or encephalitis or result in the formation of tuberculomas or abscesses. Then if you look here for this CT scan, and you can see multiple small uh, marginally enhanced uh, lesions which uh, represent tuberculomas, and these tuberculomas are sometimes surrounded by very focal brain edema whenever they are uh, in the form of active infection. And then this MRI axial T1 boost contrast, then you can see enhancement of the basal cisterns, denoting the presence of basal meningitis, and the presence of multiple enhancing nodules scattered throughout the brain parenchyma, and these represent uh, uh, tuberculomas. Uh, tuberculomas are characteristically uh, small lesions with a thick enhancing margin, usually referred to in the books as the buttonhole appearance. But sometimes tuberculomas are large and they form tuberculous abscesses. And here you can see typical example of tuberculomas that are active in, uh, as evidenced by enhancement of the wall and the presence of edema surrounding the lesions. And this is also multiple brain tuberculometer scattered in both cerebral hemispheres. And this is MRI of brain tuberculomas as uh, shown by uh, axial T1 weighted images after contrast injection. You see lesions in the brain stem and lesions in the temporal lobe as well as in the cerebellar hemispheres. As I have mentioned, the, whenever the tuberculoma is sizable and um, it uh, contains a, a central hypodensity, then you consider it a, a tuberculous abscess. And this is the original tuberculomas or the classic tuberculomas, and here an example of tuberculous abscess. And this is also an example of tuberculous abscesses. They are accumulated here in the region of the third ventricle as well as in the supracellular area and in the temporal lobe. And also you can see the presence of subdural inflammatory collection in the left frontal area. And this is also a case of tuberculous meningitis with multiple tuberculomas. You see these uh, tuberculomas with classic uh, ring-like enhancement and then uh, the thick enhancement in the sylvian cisterns, in the supracellular cistern, as well as around the uh, brain stem. Also note the marked dilatation of the temporal horns of the ventricles, denoting the presence of obstructive hydrocephalus.
and affection of the brain by fungi is uh, usually the sequelae of impairment of the immune system and uh, the fungi will also produce the same changes like TB including meningitis, encephalitis and granulomas or abscesses. And for the diagnosis of meningitis, pneumonia take enhanced meninges in the post-contrast study. You cannot uh, suggest the possible cause of this meningitis, whether it is virus or uh, bacterial or fungal infection. But one of the helpful criteria for the diagnosis of fungal cerebritis is the well-known uh, uh, characteristic signal appearance of the fungus in the T2 weighted images. And you see here in the T1 weighted image, there are lesions of intermediate uh, signal. And in the T2 weighted image, there is significant drop of signal intensity of the uh, fungal lesions. And uh, this is one of the uh, characteristic criteria. But uh, if you look here and you see an intermediate lesion in the T1 with this very dark lesion in the T2, you may suspect the presence of acute brain hemorrhage. But this post-contrast image will uh, lead you to the correct diagnosis since hemorrhage does not enhance with contrast material and the fungal lesions will show this significant pattern of enhancement. And this is a case of fungal sinusitis with uh, intracranial extension. In the T1 weighted image, the fungus is of intermediate signal and uh, there is significant drop of signal in the T2 weighted images and you see the extension in the supracellular area and in the right temporal region. And also you can see the uh, evident post-contrast enhancement of the uh, fungal lesion in the sinuses as well as in, in the intracranial area. Then we came to one of the uh, known parasitic infections of the brain parenchyma, which is the cysticercosis. The cysticercosis is considered one of the common intracranial parasitic infections caused by tinea solium. And uh, the parasite will uh, reach the body by in ingestion of contaminated food and um, it will reach the brain parenchyma and uh, lodged in the uh, brain tissue or in the meninges causing intense inflammatory uh, reaction. Then after the uh, parasite dies, it leaves uh, uh, multiple uh, foci of uh, cerebral parenchymal calcification that are indistinguishable from those uh, uh, those resulting from the congenital intracranial infection. The active lesion will be uh, like this one, a small uh, lesion surrounded by prominent uh, perifocal brain edema. The most typical uh, appearance for cysticercosis on uh, images, whether CT or MRI, is what is known as the cyst and the dot sign. And you see a, cyst, a cystic lesion with a dot inside, a cystic lesion with a dot inside, and this is one of the pathognomonic diagnostic criteria for cysticercosis. And the, 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 the scolex or the parasite will appear within the cyst as a dot, and this is a CT image showing multiple cystic cystic lesions with central dots. It is enough to see a dot within one of the lesions only. Then you consider all the lesions which do not contain dots belonging to the same, to the same pathology. Then uh, the system to dot sign is one of the helpful criteria to discriminate this lesion from tuberculoma. Since tuberculoma do not contain a central dot but the cysticercosis will have a thick enhancing margin and an internal dot sign. And the dot sign can be seen in CT, as you can see here, and also by MRI, as you can see. And this is one of the typical criteria for diagnosis of cysticercosis. And if you 
if you do not see or did not see the dot inside one of the cysts, you are not able to reach the diagnosis of cystic circosis. But here, if you look carefully for this cystic lesion, and you can see a dot inside. And if you look carefully also here, and you can see a dot inside, then you consider these secondary to neurocystic circosis. After healing of the of the disease, you are left with multiple uh, haphazardly distributed periventricular calcific foci, giving the characteristic starry sky appearance. And this is not pathognomonic for cystic circosis. It can be seen in cases with heal, healed TB and can be seen in, also in cases of congenital intracranial infection. Then you see here multiple calcific foci scattered throughout the brain parenchyma uh, uh, for the differential diagnosis, including healed cysticercosis, healed tuberculosis, and congenital intracranial infection. And one of the parasites, which is also known to affect the, uh, the cerebral tissue, is the hydatid cyst. And the hydatid cyst is diagnosed by an intraaxial lesion with what clear water content and uh, uh, there is no enhancement of the wall and there may be some calcium in the wall of the cyst itself and I think in my opinion the only intraaxial non-enhancing cyst is the hydatid cyst and this is a good example for a cystic lesion within the brain parenchyma compressing the ventricle and this is hydatid cyst this is MRI of another case showing a bigger lesion in the right cerebral hemisphere, and this is hydatid cyst. And this is also a classic appearance of an intraaxial cystic lesion with uh, some marginal calcification. Calcium can be seen in the wall of or inside the hydatid cyst. And finally, we came to a conclusion or uh, what we may say the take-home messages. And um, uh, the, you remember that we have mentioned that diffuse uh, meningeal or leptomeningeal enhancement is diagnostic of meningitis. Marginal enhancement of an intraaxial lesion is diagnosed of an abscess. If it is an extraaxial, you diagnose epidural or subdural in bioma. Periventricular calcification is diagnostic of uh, the torch infection, toxoplasma rubella, cytomegalovirus, and the herpes simplex, and also include healed cysticercosis and healed TB. Intraaxial cyst with no enhancement, in my opinion, is diagnostic of hydatid cyst. Bilateral temporal non enhancing lesions are suggestive of herpes encephalitis. They may show some enhancement, they may show internal hemorrhage but the temporal location and the clinical picture are usually uh, diagnostic. Enhancement of the wall of the ventricle is diagnostic of ependymitis. Enhance the, if there is an intraaxial small cyst with a central dot is pathognomonic for cysticercosis, the active form. The very dark signal of an intraaxial lesion in T2-weighted images is usually suggestive of a fungal infection. Thank you very much for